What's good, y'all? Welcome back to The Cycle 365. This is mini-series episode 7, and we're going to be talking about private schools, prep academies, and, you know, AAU leagues, all of those things. But first off, uh, I have a special guest with me. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? What's up, guys? My name is Gene Villanos. I am the eldest and most athletic sibling out of the three, and I just wanted to say hello. Yeah, and uh, he was on a previous Cycle 365 episode. I, I can't remember what it was, but he, he was on here before, so check that out if you haven't already. But, you know, he does have a lot of experience, I would say, in youth sports with basketball specifically, and we really haven't had a ton of, I would say, basketball experience on this show. But, you know, here he is. So why don't you go ahead and tell us about, you know, your experience in youth sports, how many years you played, what level, and, you know, how was it overall for you? So I've been playing youth sports, um, particularly in Dallas, Plano, Texas, Plano Sports Authority. We have a huge little league there called PSA. Um, since I was probably in fifth grade, did a little bit of top achievers. Also, that's more of a select league with um, old LA Lakers coach running the, the – uh, uh, he was the director of it. His name is Del Harris. You could look him up. Um, then, again, school in seventh grade. So that was kind of my experience when it comes to youth sports, primarily only in basketball, though. Yeah, and I mean, that's totally fine. That's what we're going to touch on a lot for this episode. We're going to talk some football, you know, per usual. Obviously, y'all know my experience and whatnot. But yeah, so let's get right into it. So first, before we go into the facts of it all, let's talk about opinions first. So prep schools like IMG Academy, Modern Day, Oak Hill Academy, um, Aspire Academy that LaMelo Ball went to, these are all private schools that some would say have a very unfair advantage over public schools. Um, not just because of the money, but because of the level of competition they get to play with, the exposure that they get to go through. So, I, I mean, I would say my opinion on all of those from a football perspective in a little bit. But uh, Gene, why don't you go ahead and talk about your opinions on some of these prep schools when it comes to basketball? I think it's, I think it's a little expensive when you're talking about tuition. But I think when it comes to preparedness, these prep schools really do a good job of not just showing you what you can do one on one. Like AAU, they show more of a conglomerate team effort because these are your teammates. You're not just going to an AAU tournament where you have four or five scouts and you're jacking up 50 shots to look good in front of the scouts. It's more of a team chemistry and you're seeing the same people every day when you go to school. So I think prep, prep academies and prep schools, um, it's a good way to kind of break up the talent from public school, AAU, and private school. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So do you, would you say that would be fair though for... I guess all students, because obviously there are some, you know, kids that don't have the financial means to go to a, to a private school. Most of these schools are Catholic schools, just to put that out there, but they have tuitions per year, kind of just like colleges. But would you say that's a fair, you know, idea in general, though? Absolutely not. When you have places like Sierra Canyon, you have Bronny James and another superstar. What's this? Zaire Williams. Zaire, yeah, Zaire Wade is Williams. Zaire Wade, right? Both of them. Both yeah, of them. yeah. Zaire Williams is a five star. Right? Okay, okay. Sorry, Zaire. Yeah. yeah. So, like, when you have kids teaming up with other kids, or even you throw it back to even um, Vincent St. Mary's, or like you have all of the ton all of the talent funneled into one area, and I don't think that's absolutely fair because a lot of these kids are traveling from out of state, or they're you know they're not from that local region. And to be put in a place where everyone is going there for basketball, obviously there's some type of um, favoritism there or some type of unfair, some, something that's unfair there when you have all the talent funneled into one area. The thing with these private schools, I mean, I, I think most people know this, but I'm just going to throw this out there. They could most definitely recruit players from out of state. I think every state has some sort of rule against, you know, recruiting players for a sport and whatnot, which usually comes with like, a loss of eligibility so usually one year some people will call it a red shirt year that's what kyler murray back in texas did he transferred from hebron or Louisville, the city to allen high school which happened to be just a richer school to be honest and way more resources than you yeah, probably should 
And he did end up losing a year of eligibility, which is why he only went undefeated and won three straight championships instead of four. But at these prep academies, you can recruit across state lines and there are no repercussions at all. Um, basically, all just all that happens is that you just get the athlete and no one, nobody else talks about it. It's treated as you know a transfer or as a move, something normal. And obviously, there's no national high school organization really that could you know, enforce, um, what is it, restrictions or sanctions or whatever, you know, on schools that do openly recruit. And most of these uh, prep academies do openly recruit. And before we move on to AAU, because you did mention it, I kind of just wanted to touch on my opinions with uh, some of these prep schools when it comes to football, because it's, it's very apparent in the national rankings that most of these schools are made up of prep schools. I think there are maybe one or two public schools on last year's top 25 high school football teams list, and both of those teams were from Texas. So that should say what you need to know. But, and you know, like I said, I'm, I'm super biased because I'm from Texas. I have friends who played there who are now coaching, you know, um, in the high school ranks in Texas as well. But in my opinion, Texas football as itself it doesn't need, you know, as many prep schools as a California does or as a Maryland or as a Florida because the natural talent in the public school system is so strong and it's been proven over and over again. You got guys consistently coming out like a Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Drew Brees, Adrian Peterson, you you name it, you know, and those are guys coming out of pr- just straight public schools. But the thing is, some of those public schools do have private school funding, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? So, like I was saying, a lot of the nationally ranked high schools are private schools because they do recruit and they, you know, they'll find a kid that had a lot of potential, maybe had one really good year as a freshman, and then they recruit him for his next three years. And so, and that's how they build that clout, you could say, for for their private school. And then that's how they keep recruiting more and more students. And these private schools, obviously, you know, profit off of, the football game revenue that they get, the uh, the sponsorships, the tuition, obviously, that the athlete has to pay or that someone has to pay for the athlete to get there. And, you know, we won't go too deep into that because it could get real shady real quick. But it's, in my opinion, it's it's, it's cheating to, to a degree because it's not homegrown talent. It's talent grown in other areas that you just happen to recruit, which any college could do. And so to me, that's not super impressive. That's not, you know, like there are most definitely some football players who are, who could hide behind more teammates because football's a, you know, a bigger sport player wise than basketball. You got 10 other teammates who can can make you look good compared to four other teammates in basketball, obviously. So I really do think that when it comes to prep schools, it really doesn't matter uh, football wise, you know, because. I feel like, I really do feel like that there are some situations where a player could develop no matter what, and that's just because they're cold like that. So, that's my two cents though, but we're going to move on and uh, talk about AAU a little bit. I don't know a ton about it, so why don't you go ahead and you know explain AAU and then your opinions on it. So, AAU is an organization that basically highlights the elitists of the talent when it comes to U16 or U17 or 18 years old. They split them up in divisions and classes um, according to age, and some people are talented enough to move up and play up. But basically, the the gist of what a AAU is is it it is pay to play. So that's something that I don't believe in necessarily because you can go to a more impoverished neighborhood where you have great talent that can play basketball, but will they be seen or will they be given the same opportunity as those that have the money to travel and go to California for a tournament in the weekend? And, you know, sometimes plane tickets alone are impossible for someone that don't have that type of um, monetary budget to be able to spend on their children to play and be uh, part of the elite group of talent so i personally think that aau is a flawed system a lot of the nba players um, that have played aau 
have almost played each other in high school or in middle school before they even seen each other in the NBA. So there is a specific groom type of player that can make it all the way from AAU to a D1 college and then to the pros. And I think that's definitely limiting when it comes to the overall um, fairness of who's going to be seen as um, – you know, someone that could make it to the next league because if you don't play in AAU, then you don't get to see the scouts, and then you don't go D one, and then you don't ever get a shot. Yeah, uh, no, but that, that that's fair. You know, like I, I get that. Like it's not a fair system, right? Because basically, what you're saying is that if you don't play AAU, then your chances of going pro or even going to a D one college are significantly lower. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and <clears throat> what do you know? Like what these like. I guess expenses are looking like well not because I feel like it varies from team to team but uh, well what's the base level you would say I mean I have no clue but right now off the dome we could rattle off just the shoes the jerseys mm-hmm. I mean the meals that you have to go if there if you go if you're going to California and you're from New York or you're from Virginia and your AAU game is in California just the ticket itself unless you have a great a great sponsor for the team you're gonna have to shoulder that you know, and these aren't you, when you play an AAU tournament. It's not one tournament each season. You're going to multiple tournaments multiple times. Right. So just that alone, just airfare and food, and you know the gear that these players are wearing in itself, it's it's already a lot. Would you say like baseline, like at the least, it's at least a thousand dollars? Oh, for sure. Okay. I think it's definitely more. I think it's clo- probably tipping it closer to two or three each season, in my opinion. Two thousand to three thousand. In my opinion, I could be totally wrong. Someone can fact check me. But the idea here is not to give a number. The idea is to present that, hey, not everyone's going to have this opportunity if you're not affluent in some type of manner. Yeah. No, that's for sure. Um, do you think that the AAU, like that whole system is effective in prepping athletes moving forward or is it just all like like clout i think it is effective if you're if you want to make it to the league you have to have some type of aau background a lot of these nba players right now are from aau and the reason why i say that is because aau from what i've seen doesn't really magnify team basketball like a regular school would Yes, you have your standouts at a regular public school, but the sole purpose for a tournament in AAU is to be seen by D1 scouts for college and universities. And if you do not take more shots than your teammate, or if you do not seem assertive at a certain um, in a certain tournament, then you are perceived as just a regular Joe Schmo, and the money that you put into AAU. You know, it's you're not really gonna get the return on investment for that because you're not gonna make it to the next league. You're not gonna make it to D one. You're not gonna make it to NBA without being seen as that person taking a lot of shots. I don't want to um, call anyone out, but look at someone like Julian Newman. <laughs> Julian Newman is absolutely the worst teammate that I can I've ever. Julian Newman will bring down a basketball and dribble for thirty seconds and take a half court shot and airball it. That's a type of um, behavior that is encouraged in AAU. Yes, he might have made it once or twice, and it might have been on Ball is Life or Hoop Mixtape, whatever. They make money, a lot of money on AAU games also, and let's be, I mean, public school games as well. But I don't think it's conducive to actually creating the best type of players um, here in the United States. That's why I'm such a big proponent of how they do it in Europe, where we were talking about earlier, where you could be 16 and you could declare a pro, and you could play against um, people that are really real grown men. You know, like your Luka, Luka Doncic, for example. There's a lot of people that went overseas and played and 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 did their thing overseas, and they didn't really have to go through the um, traditional route of AAU basketball and or American organized basketball and NCAA or anything like that. So I think that it 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 does AAU doesn't really prepare the correct type of basketball players out of the gate because what they're really trying to do is say you need to look better than your teammates to be noticed okay yeah no and that makes sense to me so so it's really not like i guess skill based like learning right like it's more like all right well i gotta go out here and perform right now because this is more of a showcase rather than a developmental thing is that right yes exactly okay sweet yeah and Going to that Julian Newman uh, point, you're right. He's really not 
that great of a teammate. And I'm not going to go too deep into it. I've seen my share of videos criticizing him, and I've seen some of his games. And he's, in my opinion, he's just not that good, you know. And that that kind of ties into something because I know his father started basically his own prep school for his son and daughter. Is that right? Yes. In Florida. I, what was the name? I forgot the name. And, probably doesn't yeah matter. I, <laughs> I know they played against img academy's basketball team though yes which is a very established uh basketball program who i believe have put out a couple nba players uh -huh. but i mean anyways when they went up against img academy he basically got crushed and it wasn't even close well yeah. not just him but his whole you know prep school team got crushed and it wasn't even close and you could see the you know the difference the level of preparedness between guys who are just AAU stars and then guys who went to an actual prep school. And by the way, AAU is not like, I mean, I guess you can say it's year-round, but isn't it mostly like off-season basketball? Yeah, it's, yeah it's more off-season. I mean, it, it, so what they try to do with basketball is they really try to give precedence to the actual high school um league season, season you okay. know. So then everything else with AAU is more of off-season. Okay, yeah. For sure. And so, I know at IMG, I'm sure some of those guys could still play AAU, but IMG is probably one of the most prominent, you know, academies in in the United States. It, it's very athlete-centric. -cent That's how they make their money. That's their brand, you know, uh, producing great athletes. And they have produced a lot of great athletes. They've been around for over 20 years now. They've produced Olympians, they've produced basketball players, football players, tennis players, whatever, you name it. You know, and that's that's their thing. And, you know, like throwing it back to the IMG Academy versus uh, Julian Newman's uh, squad, like those games, like I was saying, it was obvious that, oh my gosh, it was obvious that the skill development wasn't, was was very different, right? Obviously, Newman's team was new. Right, they've yes. only been around a year or so, and IMG's been around for twenty years. But a prep school, in my opinion, will probably do, you know, maybe a little bit better preparing an athlete for the pros or for the next level of whatever sport they're playing than AAU. It seems is that an accurate thing to say? Am I on, you know, on target, off target? Yeah, I mean that's. I think that's pretty spot on, you know, and, and th there's many differences between the AAU and, and prep school. I feel like uh, one of the biggest differences is, like I mentioned earlier, is prep school is really trying to um, make, like, benefit the team, you know, right. really benefit the team as a whole. So you have the trainers that you could go to all year round. You have the, the type of practices that you do with your teammates. You're really building a team and a squad. But when you go to AAU, sometimes the way that they train is, yes, you'll have practices, but what are they doing on the, on, when you guys are not having practices? You know, right. They're not together all the time, and I feel like there's a lot of um, imbalance there uh, team chemistry-wise. So it really just boils down to it being more of a team concept in prep as is opposed to being a solo dolo thing for AAU. I feel like that's kind of the biggest difference. Yeah, for sure. And so we're, we're going to transition a little bit here, but I mean, this is more of a personal question, but if you had a child or, you know, a kid you were mentoring, would you put that kid in AAU or a prep school and why or why not? Well, my kid's going straight to the NBA. Out of, well, out of the go womb. Go on, go on. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, I would, um, if, it depends where I live. Right now, Colorado, I, I don't have any much choices. You know, if I was to have a child here and I want him to be seen, where where do they go watch 3A, 4A basketball here in Colorado? You know, there's not, it's, it's very slim. So at that point, um, I would probably choose AAU. I would probably choose AAU because for me, I'd want, sometimes when you go to prep school and they're all the way across the, um, the the country. state the country then you you know i don't have access to my child yeah you know, i, I sure. want to be able to be there you know i would love to go to um aau practices and be there and travel with him you know to, to to give guidance that's another thing that you get during prep school is you're almost giving the school the right to raise your kid for a season you know and that in itself if you don't live it where spire academy is or if you don't live where img academy is then it's up to the teachers, the trainers, the coaches, the teammates to raise your own child. So from a parenting perspective, I, I wouldn't be too comfortable with that. With uh, with a prep school? Yes, right. with a prep school. Right. I would rather go AAU. Okay. Yeah, and that's fair. 
Um, I mean, obviously, football is a little bit different. There's, I wouldn't say there's really anything like AAU for football. Like, obviously, there are All-American games, showcase games, but it's not like a full season. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a one-off game, and if you play good, you're good. If not, then I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. But even then, honestly, it, it, I think it really does depend on where you live. For sure, because there are a bunch of different options. I'm not gonna lie; like I've talked about this, but bef- I've talked about this before. But Colorado isn't, I guess, the most elite state for sports, and that's no shade at all. Like it, it's not their fault they can't compete with the likes of a Texas or a California. Even you know that's just the culture, and every state has its own culture based on the region and whatnot. And every state values something else. And I think that's something very fair to say. Because throwing it back to what I was talking about earlier with Texas, like they don't need prep schools to be good. The public schools are good as is because that's the that's the culture. Like football is is Texas basically and vice versa. And so if I lived in Texas, I would for sure keep my kid in a public school. Um, I would I prob- maybe I'd think about transferring them, but that, you know, it is what it is. I think any kid in Texas could, you know, succeed to a degree anywhere i would say even in the real grand valley we could throw it back to mini series episode two when i was talking with kenny long from friday night tykes he was talking about how the rgv the Rio grand valley is on the rise because in part of what you know the the league, the type of football league texas youth football association league what they've done for the kids in that area having them play against you know tougher competitions in um tougher competition in houston san antonio dallas and whatnot and so that developed those kids so by the time they get to high school they're ready to see those kids at the high school level now that they've hit puberty they've grown a little bit and they've put on way more muscle and it basically it's all game and so in texas that's like i was saying that's that's different there's no question i'd keep them in a public school but in any other state i would most definitely consider you know putting them in a prep school for football if that's what they want to do there's just, like you said, there is a lot that goes into it because you're away from your kid. And unless you're, like you, the parent, is like super rich and could afford to live, you know, by the prep school, which usually those are richer areas, then that, you know, then you're not going to see your kid for most of the year. Because it's not just a season, it's the whole year, the whole school year that is that they're at that prep school. Mm-hmm. And I know, uh, this is just another thing, I don't know if you've ever seen QB1 Beyond the Lights it's this like Netflix, do- well now it's a Netflix documentary, TV series, the type of thing that follow like the top quarterback prospects every year, going all the way back to the first year where they followed the likes of Jake Fromm from Georgia. They eventually followed Justin Fields, uh, who was the number one QB a couple years ago, and then Spencer Rattler, who was the number one quarterback, I think in 20 of the class of 2019, and he's at Oklahoma right now. And so they follow a bunch of those prospects and some of those kids go to prep schools and oh i'm this is a really long time ago but in the first season they followed this kid called tate martell and he was this quarterback out of bishop gorman in nevada and bishop gorman's one of those schools that really profited off of their team doing well you know because basically all they do is play a bunch of public schools while they have a bunch of five and four star guys and that's just how it is and so they just whoop on everyone but because of this tate martell was considered possibly one of the greatest high school football players of all time you know and <laughs> I, I don't know how accurate that is like i know a lot of people want to say like oh yeah he's for sure in that conversation but the level of competition he plays like it, it wasn't like they played other prep schools Usually most prep schools, unless you're in like the California Trinity League, which makes up, which is made up of like, you know, the likes of Modern Day, St. John, Bosco, like most prep schools don't play other prep schools. They'll maybe play two or three, you know, Mm -hmm. but the other seven or so are against public schools that don't have the kind of funding. They can't recruit um, and, you know, they don't probably don't have the year round time to train their kids like these prep schools do. But anyways, in, in QB1, it really showed just the, you know, the difference level in talent, you know, between these prep schools. I would say schedule-wise, between these prep schools and public schools. Because Jake Fromm, he's from a public school, right, back in Georgia. And he played against the likes of, even then, you know, Georgia's one of those 
you know, one-of-a-kind states like Texas. He played against the likes of Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, all these, like, number one quarterbacks of, you know, other classes. Um, so, yeah. But Tate Martell didn't really play against anybody like that. He played against one Texas school, which barely made the playoffs that year. And then, you know, he was talking all that trash. And so I'm just going to – I'm going to pull back a little bit. I'm going to pull back a little bit. But he was talking a bunch of trash, and that was a big deal. But people overlooked it because they're like, man, dude, this guy's good. But in reality, he had a couple of guys who went to the NFL as linemen, as running backs, as wide receivers who are now doing their thing in the NFL. And while Tate Martell is at his second school as a fourth string quarterback at the University of Miami, even though he transferred there. So, you know, that's his, that's that whole thing. Mm. And so that's what I'm saying basically is that some prep schools, when it comes to football, really don't prepare your kids for, a, how should I say, a higher level competition. But it's more of like an AU type of atmosphere where they like, you know, it's it's like a box office type of thing, sure. right? Like it's a showcase type of thing, and that's why you're out there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not because you'll be better as a football player per se, but you'll your talents that are already there will be shown. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. Yes. So yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, so moving forward with the effectiveness of AU and prep schools, what are some changes you would make to either Oh, let's start with AU. What are some changes you would make to the AU system to make it better? Or what is maybe a whole other system you would add? You did mention the EuroLeague and whatnot before. Yeah, um, for AAU, I, I feel like it's... I just feel like not everyone is getting a fair shake when you have things in play that it's basically the rules are pay to play. You know, um, obviously when you go to a regular league, you have to play, you know, you have to pay money, but just the type of exposure AAU has compared to any other um, circuit, especially for prospects that are trying to go D1 um, when it comes to basketball, is just so overpowering. I feel like a one, one thing I would maybe change is look at the pricing to make it more affordable okay. or maybe have more sponsors that are willing to sponsor a more impoverished city or, you know, like... Um, uh, a place that doesn't have the affluence of these regular people that are putting their kids in AAU. I think being able to level the, fl- the, the playing field financially is, is already such a huge change. But that change is so warranted that I feel like it'll actually bring more talent into the NBA that whenever um, these kids finish D1 or D, or, you know, whatever university they come from, they're, they're getting the fair shake in the beginning. And so I feel like money is the biggest change that I would definitely um, try to recreate when it comes to AAU. Okay. So will, will that mean like maybe having, I guess, how should I say this, like sponsors that maybe pulled to an overall fund for all AAU teams? Do you think that might be a possible thing? Or? Yeah, I mean, that would that would be a start. You know, that would be a start. And I, and, and I don't really know exactly what I would like to do. I just know that some of the prices for an AAU season or, or being invited to an AAU, AAU team is such a selective process right. that you're really overlooking a lot of the people and a lot of the, the kids that only play for um, a small town or you know or a, 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 a city that doesn't have that many resources when it comes to um, basketball or finances in general um, I feel like maybe maybe understanding how we can recreate a system that works for everybody financially should be the forefront of how to change AAU as a circuit that's fair and I, I agree with you there, but do you think there's a better system? Because I personally really like how the EuroLeague does it. Having their kids, uh, you know, st- how what is it, go pro 
at the age of 16, we mm-hmm. either even be kind of groomed by mm-hmm. an organization at 12 moving up, but maybe not necessarily getting paid like that. Do you think that's something that would be much better than the AAU system right now? So if I had to pick between AAU or prep, I wouldn't pick either of them. And I think you bring up a great point. I think this has been um, the tra- trajectory of how we want to have talent funnel in, especially into the NBA, with LeVar Ball starting the JBA. That was, I think, a really good idea that was poorly executed. I think if they had created more marketing and more of a thought process of how to do the JBA and maybe... Um, more vetted people that are advisors, not just LeVar Ball's family. Yeah. I think they would have had better resources and actual better vision. But I do like the concept. And that, like you like you pointed out, how they do it in Euro, if you are able at 16, 17 to keep up with the pros or just go pro, I think that, that in itself is a better situation than even going to a university here and having to play one year and then then you're eligible for the draft i think that's a joke i think you should be able to come out of high school and play basketball if you know what you want to do why do you have to go to school to do it is basically my point you know yeah no for sure and i think that's fair how far off do you think i guess the united states or maybe the nba is from you know creating something like that here I think we're very far, and a lot of it is because of money. A lot of the times you have the local teams, you know, uh, the, the local teams and local universities scouting young 15, 14 year old AAU kids at basketball tournaments. So there's a machine in play, and a lot of these machines is quid quo pro. So, you know, the AAU team is getting looks from a scout that works for Michigan University or, you know, um, Texas. And in return, they get sponsorship, you know. So this is yeah. a whole cyclical thing. So I think for something like that to be taken out of play, it's like you're trying to break up a monopoly, you know. And I think that's very difficult to do, especially if this has been the normal for so long. Yeah, no, and that's fair. And so what what you're saying is basically that you don't think the NBA would cross that line. And like, you know, obviously potentially hurt a business. It would probably affect college basketball a ton and whatnot for sure. And even high school basketball to that degree. Uh, Prep schools especially who, you know, who thrive off of that. But what you're saying is that the NBA wouldn't cross that line. No, I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's a business, you know, and, and and I think there's special gatekeepers in the business of the NBA, NFL, there, you, you know, there's there's a saying: you can have the talent, but that that doesn't mean that you're gonna make it. That's just that's just pure facts. Okay. Yeah. No, that's for sure. So so that's way off the line. But I know you didn't play any football, but I still would like to know your opinions on this. But what do you think about something like this happening for football? Because before the XFL went bankrupt, which by the way, they still might come back. It's a whole. It's not even that big of a conspiracy. They're still around. Their namesake is still around. So they're not officially out of business. But before the XFL went out of business, they were considering like way down the line. Way down the line as in three or four years down the line. So, you know, not super long. They were considering having players come straight out of high school to their league. And for them to basically go pro in the XFL. And they kind of tested it out. Because there is one player by the name of Kenny Robinson, who was a safety for the St. Louis Battlehawks. Some whole thing happened at West Virginia where he was wrongfully accused of something. You know how it goes. and So he decided to leave because his, his mother had cancer and he wanted to make money for her. Um, like right now. And so he went to the Battlehawks, he got drafted, earned his, you know, 50k a year, which for a college student, a 20 year old, 19 year old is a lot. And then right after that, he was eligible for the NFL draft, and then he was drafted. But do you think something like that set up for football players in high school is a possible thing? Like, kind of like a EuroLeague setup, but, you know, instead of going to college, they either go pro or maybe go pro a little <clears throat> bit younger. Um... I don't know if that would be possible, to be perfectly honest, especially uh-huh. in a sport like football. Um, what we're discussing here is the potential of maybe the NFL adopting the no 
college rule and having high school recruits just go straight to the NFL? Is that um, yeah, to a degree, or to a degree. even go into like a more devel- developmental league? You know, yeah. which is something that's been in the talks so. Yeah, I, that that is a better option. I feel like if the NFL had some type of G League um, transitional phase, but when you're, I think when you're comparing football and basketball, it's almost. Um, apples and oranges i feel like yeah. football is such a physical sport where i don't know a lot of 18 year olds that have the body that they need to survive in the nfl if you have an 18 year old running back that's 200 pounds and you have a grown 35 year old man that's tipping 300 i think you know i i think the lack of experience there there could be detrimental health wise when it comes to football players, not to say that it's any different from basketball, but basketball is such it's more of a uh, you need finesse in, in in football, but basketball is less physical. We can agree to that. Obviously, yeah. you're not getting pounded in the head and getting CTE like you would if you're in the NFL. So I think um, from a safety perspective that that could be almost like a dangerous move. But there are exceptions to the rules. Yeah, for sure. And uh, well, let's say that. Let's say that wasn't a thing because, let's be honest, the NFL isn't exactly the most progressive league in the world. You know, just 10 years ago, they just acknowledged that CTE was a thing. Less than 10 years, actually, even though it's been around for over 100 now. So, let's just say, you know, the NFL ignores that. Because uh, at the same time, there are kids that are just, like, freaks of nature. Cam Newton was 6'5", 240 pounds coming out of high school. So, he could have played in the NFL. And then, you know, if we were going to, you know go back in time a little bit some people could have said Lamar Jackson potentially could have played in the the NFL not because you know he's extremely built and even now he's still relatively skinny for a quarterback but he just has elite speed you know and then some people even said that Trevor Lawrence out of Clemson he's considered like the next Peyton Manning like he could he could be something that could have out of high school yeah Trevor Lawrence yes what was his weight in high school 160 no, he was no, not. No, to, no. Tr- Sunshine. We're talking about yeah, Sunshine. Yeah, yeah. There's no way. There's no, no yeah. way he was. Well, you know, we, we, we might need to have to look that up <laughs> to see how old Trevor Lawrence was when he was 18. Right now, he's, I mean, yes, he may be 200 pounds, but let's, let's just be honest. He's not the biggest, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, out of high school, he was 6'6", 200. Because right now, he's 6'6", 220. So he gained 20 pounds. Yeah, in, in two years. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, all right. <laughs> I mean, that's fine, I yeah. guess. But, I mean, it, in my opinion, uh, being a 6'6 quarterback and being 200 pounds, that's still – you're still looking like a target out there, in my opinion. That's fair. The 220 that you need, I feel like he needs a little bit more. But, you know um, – but, but my point is, yes, I do understand what you're saying. But my point is more of um, – a safety issue, a physical issue, but if you do have those freak of natures, like you listed, the Cam Newtons, you know, I guess the the, the um, Sunshine from Clemson, um, maybe you know, but but I, I feel like whenever we're talking about prep school and the way that the draft is created, especially for um, the NFL as opposed to the NBA, I feel like the NFL is so, you can just gain so much um, knowledge working with a university or college team. You know, the dynamics of teamwork itself and being able to read and recognize is so important. And that experience is 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 is, is um, unparalleled to anything else, in my opinion. So, I mean, yeah, I think if if the physical attributes didn't matter, why not? You know, okay. why, why not? That's fair. And there's also a scenario where they just play each other and get paid for it. You know, so it is more of a farm league and there's like an age cap, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, and then they could either go pro or whatnot. Because I know the NBA G League, um, so the deal with that is that all those players are on the same team, right? And they can only play for one year is what I saw. And then after that, they could either get signed again by the G League, but then they wouldn't be in the same program, or they could, like, you know, declare for the draft. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I think it's something that could happen. I could see the NFL potentially looking the other way. I, I... I find it hard to believe that they throw their, you know, teenage players right into the fire, like, against other pros, but maybe in a developmental type of league. Sure. You know, um, trust me, I really don't think the NFL would have a problem, um, you know, mooching off the profits of prep schools, mm. of colleges and whatnot, because that's a billion dollar, more than a billion dollar business yeah. right there. And that's something that they could expand on. And I think that also brings... 
you know, um, a lot of media coverage into it, sponsorships and whatnot. And, you know, it's it's a it's a whole business. So that's that's football. But no, I, I get what you're saying, though. Football and basketball are both most definitely different sports. So you got to approach it differently for sure. So, yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to be closing up here real quick. But I just wanted to bring this up. I th you, you already made it obvious with AAU that the cost may not be as beneficial for these athletes. Like, how should I say this? The cost of an AAU team or membership is not worth what an athlete might be getting out of, right? But for prep schools, some of these tuitions, well, I could guarantee you, are way more than some people might even spend on AAU in four or five years. IMG Academy, for for instance, um, their tuition per year is over 70k a year for every athlete they bring in. You know, I actually, if I want to be more specific, it's closer to 74, 75k a year. And so obviously that covers room and board, food, uh, training equipment, and then you know it pays the probably you know NFL coaches and whatnot, or former NFL coaches, players that they have in there as a, advisors. But do you think? With all that being said, that amount of money um, being paid to a private school is worth an athlete going to a prep school and potentially getting better. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why? Why? Why is that? I mean, how many of these kids are really going there not on a scholarship? Is my question. Who's paying the out-of-pocket seventy thousand? That's not the school or not some type of sponsorship. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For someone to be paying that money and not getting. A scholarship, maybe you shouldn't be going to a prep school. Sure. You know, if you're not scouted and not brought on and not someone's not sponsoring you to go or or paying tuition for you or a scholarship isn't in play, then who who's trying to do that? In my opinion, only the people that are super super rich and affluent. And to be honest, maybe your talent isn't that good. Yeah. Maybe your talent isn't good. That's why you can't make it in a public school and you have to pay $70,000 out of your mother or your father's, you know, paycheck because you're not getting any scholarships to a prep school. So that just boils down to talent, I feel like. And I think that it's, I mean, yes, it's, it. Uh, I don't know what I don't know, but I think if you end up going to a prep school and you make it to the NBA, then the ROI is justified. If you go to a prep school and spend the 70000 however much, if you go there for four years, that's that's that's, uh, that's a lot of money, and you don't make it, then you just wasted a lot of money, you know. Yeah. So it's being practical about it, you know. I th I think hey, if whatever um, um, whatever you get, whatever you get as a uh, return on your investment, if you make it to the next level, then yeah, I guess prep school is you know a good benefit. Would you say there's a difference between basketball and football when it comes to how beneficial a prep school might be compared to the cost? Absolutely. I feel like um, football and I, I, I've never even really heard of prep school in football that way. And, and you know, you have because you're really, you, you know, in the space. But for me, I, I, I'm not aware, you know, so maybe that just means that football needs to have more coverage i don't know um there's a lot of uh money that is to be made between aau prep schools and televising high school games in the last 10 years when you have huge channels like ball is life um hoop mixtapes anything of that matter where they document uh these kids highlights and put it on a clip in a reel and you know you have that and you have that circulating on social media and for me, I haven't seen it with football, so I, I have, I, I think that prep school for basketball is fine, but for football, I haven't, I, I wouldn't do it. You know, I wouldn't advocate for it, in my opinion. Yeah, no, for sure, and I, I totally get that. With football, the numbers are most definitely not as good as they are for uh, prep school basketball teams. Honestly, you know, it varies from school to school and from area to area, like I've been saying, but. The number of prep school football players that go pro is about the same as public school. Honestly, public school might still be a little bit more, you know. And uh, there are some schools that most people don't know are private school. Like, I know some people didn't think, you know, modern day, uh, historically, you know, big football school uh, was, a, was a prep school. But they are, you know. They're 
you know, their tuition isn't anything near IMGs. It's closer to 40 or 50K a year, though. But they have put out some guys, but if I'm being honest, there are most definitely other high schools, public high schools, that do just the same thing but with less money. You know, and I mean, that should really say all you need to know. So for football, I would say it's most definitely more risky because, you know, obviously there's way more football players in the world than basketball players, I would say. At least in the United States. I would say the United States, maybe not the world, because, you know, football is not an... American football is not an international sport like that. But, you know, obviously you got at least 22 players. Those are just the starters. And then however many backups. And then there are thousands upon thousands of programs in uh, in America. So, in general, those odds aren't good. And then I just really don't think prep schools help with that. But, uh, yeah. So, do you have any closing statements before we wrap this all up? Man, I just hope in the future there's some type of intermediary circuit or system for these kids to be able to showcase their talent without being so biased for pay pay to play yeah you know that's a that's a big thing because not like i said before it's it's a lot of these people are groomed to go to the next level because they have to go through this circuit to do so and i just think if you have the innovation and even social media and the online culture you can leverage some type of system or some type of association or organization that breaks up the aau and prep and all these different channels where all of the talent is funneled in just between these areas i think that we could really spread the love and i think that um it'll benefit the game in general where you have more of a variety of who gets to make it at the professional level yeah no for sure and i agree would do you just last question sure. but do you think social media will play a big role in you know bridging that gap Yes, absolutely. Going back to, I gradu- I'm, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys my age, but I graduated high school in 2008. And I have a lot of friends back then that are trying to make their own YouTube highlight reels. And it's like in 480p, everything is just so grainy. But now the technology and the standard of creative content when it comes to sports and youth sports in general is so amazing where you have someone that might be a two-star recruit because of the way that their clips are cut up, could look like a five-star recruit online. So I believe that social media is a huge engine to propel the uh, new athletes that are coming up when it comes to who they are, their daily vlogs, their training and nutrition regimens. You really get an inside look between what they do and what they do in the next level. And that's one of the reasons why I believe LaMelo Ball is such a huge um, person in in the space right now of the NBA because we've kept up with him ever since he was 15, 14 years old. Yes, he has some, you know, Lonzo and, you know, his, his dad. But I think that social media really helped propel him to the next level when it comes to showcasing his talent on a worldwide stage. Yeah, no, for sure. And I agree. Um, you know, talking about how a two-star guy could look like a five-star guy in their highlight reel. You know, without the internet, that would obviously not be possible. Honestly, without the internet, that kid may not even be seen because even just a couple of days ago, I was doing some scouting for one of the other hosts on this podcast, Jesse, who's a college football coach now up in Illinois. And, you know, he needed to find some guys who were not signed yet. So basically, they weren't ranked and whatnot and those are really hard to come by because the whole you know five star four star that whole system of rating uh, at least in football is not the best i would say because there are so many players that go unseen right and so honestly without the likes of huddle max preps all those uh you know statistical websites and highlight reel websites i would not have been able to find you know the couple of linemen needed to potentially get contacted and signed right before the season as late as it is in the recruiting trail because uh as of now we're recording this july 19th and you know the football season obviously starts in august so without those um internet resources i really don't think that finding these athletes would be as possible without you know without them obviously so yeah anyways that's it uh appreciate you coming on man Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. 
No, for sure. Hopefully, we could have you on more in the future. But yeah, anyways, that wraps up the seventh episode of this summer mini series on youth sports. Make sure you tune in next week where our boy Cody interviews a couple LGBTQ athletes and gets their perspective on youth sports and their experiences. So yeah, show us some love on social media at the Cycle Three Six Five or on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and then. We're on all major streaming platforms. Make sure you give us a share and uh, give us a nice rating. Anyways, peace.